Apostates Anonymous, the show you turn to when you're no longer an evangelical, with your hosts, hosts, authors Keith Giles and Matthew J. DiStefano. You're listening to Apostates Anonymous. Before we get into today's episode, we need to take a moment to hear a word from our sponsor. Everyone loves porn, but let's face it, there's nothing out there that caters to the Bible-believing, freedom-loving conservative in America until now. That's right, finally, there's a site for you. At Wet Ass P Word, you'll not only discover that hot Second Amendment action you've always craved, you'll do so while owning the libs. Into low hanging truck nuts, we've got that. Biblically sound backdoor, we've got that too. If role playing is your thing, we've even got fake celebrity videos featuring Tucker Carlson, Ann Coulter, and who can forget Candace Owens. Just no gay stuff, got it? So head on over to Wet Ass P Word and use the promo code Conservative Cream Pie now to save 69% off your first month. That's Conservative Cream Pie to save 69% off your first month. We know you've got a hard on for Jesus. Now you can prove it. A lot more vulgar. Hey, everybody. We are back. Can you believe it? Uh, Woo! Wow. Who's that? <laughs> oh, yeah. Holy there's, shit. There's, you're not alone anymore. I'm not alone. Um, so, yeah, for those who can't figure out by the logo and by the new intro, well, we I've been gone since I think April was my last episode, and now we are back. And who is this we? Well, if you don't know from the logo, it's none other than Keith Giles. Yeah, hey. Uh, you know, I was sitting around, so I just want to explain a little bit how I ended up here. So, you know, I was sitting around, I was thinking, you know, I, I do the Heretic Happy Hour podcast, and um, I do this uh, Second Cup with Keith podcast, and then I'm doing this Threads podcast, and, um, and I was doing the Peace Catalyst podcast, and then I was doing this Imaginary Lines podcast, and I was thinking, you know what I need to do? I think I need to have another podcast. Another podcast. That's, that's what I was missing. And uh, <laughs> yeah. so, yes, let's do it. So the well, the pitch was easy though. I'll do all the editing. All you yeah. have to do is show up and talk for I don't know forty five minutes to an hour, and then yeah. go on your merry way and have yeah. a hap- have a great fucking day. <laughs> that's exactly right, and that's those are the kinds of podcasts I prefer. Are the ones where I just show up, plug in my microphone, talk for a little bit, and say goodbye, and then somebody else, you know, in the background, puts in the music. Does and the, the, thank- the thankless work? I don't even know how that works. Uploading the podcast, however you do that, to the something yeah. to the internet, somehow it just shows up. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Well, there will be some, um, I guess, some sort of uh, preparation, but it's already stuff we're doing because what what we dis- discussed doing was kind of reacting to this modern movement of evangelicals deciding to talk about deconstruction. Um, Like we said before hitting record, you and I talking about the art of motorcycle repair, which we know nothing about. So that's kind of what they're doing. (laughs) And we're already watching those videos. We're already reading those articles. I I don't know about you, but, you know, Keith is a fellow Pathos blogger. But sometimes when I don't know what to write about, I just go to the Gospel Coalition (laughs) website or Desiring God, or I hold my breath and go to Elisa Childers' YouTube yep. page and decide, oh, well, there's an easy topic to talk about. Oh, yeah. There's a, a never-ending supply of things that will trigger us, that will get us like, what? They're saying, who said what? So um, triggered. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. And so yeah, I think we won't have any problem filling up uh, an episode's worth of content, even if all we did, like you said, was respond to Alyssa Childers or Sean McDowell or Mike Winger or what's that guy, Matt Chandler. and Matt Chandler's Matt, Matt Chandler is the new one. I don't even know who the guy is. I never heard but... of him until I saw the clip of it. And then, you know what? I got to say, though, can I just say this about what he said? You can say whatever you want on the show. Yes. OK, so so I saw the clip and uh, and I and then paraphrasing, I think that the, the main thing he got in trouble for was the thing about uh, saying that, you know, he thinks that first of all, that people are going into deconstruction because it's this, it's, uh, it's sexy. So sexy. It's so sexy. And then, um, and then his whole thing is like, you know, I don't believe that if you've had an experience with Jesus that you could ever deconstruct. And, and I'll be honest, I, when I heard him, when I watched the clip, I thought to myself, he, he's right about two things. 
Okay. So one thing I think he's right about is that in my experience, a lot of people uh, who have deconstructed, um, some of them have had what they would call spiritual experiences with God or Jesus right in their background. Like at some point they felt like God spoke to them or they had a dream or a vision or they had some sort of mystical spiritual experience. And those people typically will deconstruct a lot of their theology, but they probably won't deconvert. And, and by the way, I think that's what Matt is really saying is deconversion, right. not deconstruction. But so anyway, on that level, I thought, well, in a way he's right. Cause a lot of times it's the people who have had some kind of experience who uh, it's di- it's more difficult for them to walk away from Jesus, you know, in Christianity in some level. And it's much more difficult for people who, and uh, by the way, there's many of them who would say, I was a Christian my whole life and I never heard God. I never heard his voice. I never had any dreams or visions or spiritual ex- mystical experiences at all. And it is, I think it's much harder for someone in that situation when they've deconstructed all their theology to have anything to left to hold on to. I think it's, I, I, so I agree with him in a way he's sort of kind of right. Uh, in that area. But the other thing he was right about is, you know, Matt, you and I are kind of sexy. So sexy. Yes. So, you know, he's, he's right about two things. Yeah. I mean, my wife would agree. I don't know about if she thinks you're sexy. I mean, no offense. But she, would, <laughs> she, would, she would agree that I'm sexy. I can't, I'm not going to speak for her. You know, is she, she there? Could you go ask her? No, she's not. I'll, <laughs> I'll text her and I'll ask her, do you think Keith Giles is sexy? <laughs> we'll report back to the listeners. Um, <laughs> No, all kidding aside, like, I think that is so, it, it's, um, what's the meme? It's like, tell tell us you don't know about deconstruction without telling us you don't know about deconstruction. Oh, that's it's right. like, have you not talked to anyone? Like, let's use Rob Bell as the class, the classic case, right? Rob Bell, super famous in a way, but like Christian famous before his deconstruction, we'll call it. Right. And, and I don't even know if you, he would use that term, but we will for now. He was very uh, well known, published lots of books, well known. packing right. out stadiums. Right, but, yeah. but kind of Christian famous, but lost everything. And so even if you use Rob, oh, see, Rob Bell did it, and now he's got all this following. He's been on Oprah, blah, blah, blah. But let's let's not forget, he lost everything before that. Yeah. And a lot of us, even if we have, even if we have no platform, we just deconstruct with our church and, and they find out or our family or our friends like it is not sexy. It's like no. unless you think like dragging your ass through the mud is sexy because that's what it kind of is. Right. And, and 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 I don't think that's what Chandler means. So it's obviously like this dude has no clue what it's really like. Right. No, that's exactly right. I mean, this, so so, you know, first of all, again, because Matt Chandler and Alyssa Children and all these other people too, like um they do videos or they make commentary when they see a famous person deconstruct, right? So right. Kevin Max, you know, from DC Talk tweets something about deconstructing. And, oh, well, he's just doing that for fame and attention. Like, yep. but Derek, see, Derek Webb, Derek Webb, right. Or yeah. yeah, anybody like that, Rob Bell, whatever. So yeah. they look at that and they say, oh, it's because they are doing it for attention. Well, uh, but see, like to your point, if they knew an actual, you know, Joe Nobody, and, and who really was deconstructing, they'd spent some time talking to that person. They would know, well, this person's not doing it for fame or money or popularity no. because you are, you're you getting your ass kicked. Yeah. You're having your family members, your friends, and your church and your pastor call you a heretic and, and you know, kick you yeah. out. Or, you know, like that's not, nobody is moving. No one's going like, hey, this is a great move. And that's the yeah. other, that's the other, you know, dead giveaway of before you deconstruct, you right. should listen to that. What? <laughs> you don't choose. You don't choose. To, that's what I wrote a recent article about that. It's like you don't choose to deconstruct. Yeah. It just kind of comes upon you. Yes. You don't and, just wake up and go, you know what? Am, I got to yeah. go, got to go to pick up the dry cleaning. I need to drop right. some things off at the post office. And you know what? Maybe I'll deconstruct uh, after yeah. lunch. Like, no. Maybe, it I'll, work maybe I'll question God today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it, it's, it, it's kind of, uh, it's, I don't want to use the word offensive because I don't find it offensive, but it's very off-putting when someone says, oh, you do it for the fame and the note, right? It's like, no, those of us who like Heretic Happy Hour is pretty popular um, and, 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 it, and it reaches people who are deconstructing, who are questioning, yeah. but it's like, yo, we earn that shit. Oh, yeah. We put in the hard work. We put in the blood, sweat, and tears. And so don't fucking, don't diminish our work. If those of us who do have a platform because of deconstruction, and, and I'll admit that, but it's but it's not like it's handed to you. Like, oh, no. you just did it because it's sexy and it's popular. No, 
We did the work. Like we're doing the work. We're meeting people where they're at and we're not demonizing those who have questions and doubts. Yeah, we didn't we didn't sit in a focus group and, and sit around and go, okay, what's what's let's, gonna be popular? Let's look at what's gonna be popular in a few years. Yeah. Hey, you know this deconstruction thing, that that could be something. Yeah, yeah, I mean the fact that the Heretic Happy Hour podcast is so popular is because so many average, you know, so many of the average Christian in the pews, uh, they are questioning their faith and uh, the, if there's anything too, it's like, yeah, it's because we're not alone. And, uh, and, and obviously this is the reason why now these um, it's become very popular for evangelical Christians to, uh, to com- make comments about this movement because now it's happening and they don't understand it. They're scared and they have to demonize it or label it or, you know, come up with some, some reasons. And if anybody is using it for content, if anybody is saying, hey, this deconstruction thing is popular, let's talk about it to get hits and ratings. It's those guys because mm-hmm. because uh, they don't know what they're talking about. They're only talking about it because they recognize, oh, this is a thing. And I yeah. guess we need to talk about it or address it in some way. And hey, look, when I do that, I get a whole bunch of hits. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're yeah because they don't they're not doing it because they know what they're talking about because they yeah. really experienced it. And even no matter what Alyssa Childers says, she was a progressive Christian for like a, a month, and and all that means is she went to a church that turned out to be progressive and said, "Oh crap, I'm in a progressive church," and left. Well, and it you're I think you're right. Like I, I don't like to weigh in on the reason people do people do things, but you can't help but notice. Like um, I think it was Joshua Harris. Uh-huh. of the Gospel Coalition. Like, if you go to their website, I don't know about the time of record, I mean, of, of this coming out, but recording this, his his article is still on the front page as the most popular article on Gospel Coalition. It's like the four causes of deconstruction, two of which he says are street cred and, and a desire to sin, which is <sighs> laughable and ridiculous. Like, street cred. Like, street cred, <laughs> like, oh, it's so fucking cool, dude. Like, I've got so much cred right now. I got and the destruction dis- tattoo. Like, yeah. <laughs> I did this thing on TikTok the other day. I was like, um, with his article, tweet or Twitter, p- promoting his article in the background about how I'm going to go cheat on my wife now that I've deconstructed uh-huh. because like God's not going to punish me. So I'm just going to go out and, you know, yeah. have rampant sex with ev- whoever I want. And it's just like, dude, again, <laughs> you may have talked to people who have deconstructed, but you're certainly not listening, <laughs> you right. know, because it's like a desire to sin. Like how, it's just so stupid. It is. And and then I think the other thing about that too, when you, when they say, I'm trying, I'm trying to understand it from their perspective too. Like, okay, giving them the benefit of the doubt. So maybe they have talked to somebody in their church who was deconstructing and maybe that person was gay. And that person was saying, you know, I'm tired of pretending not to be gay. I, I really feel like, you know, I've looked into this. I don't think the scriptures really condemn this lifestyle and therefore I'm deconstructing this and I'm going to, and now I'm going to just go and be gay and not be ashamed of that. Now I can see where these other guys would look at that and say, Oh, see, they just want to sin. Well, it's because you've defined sin uh, already in advance. And so, and so therefore they're sinning or, or, you know, they, they're, they've deconstructed. And so they're doubting uh, the penal substitutionary atonement theory, which in your mind is the gospel. So therefore, oh, you're denying the gospel. Therefore, you want to live in sin. So, I mean, I guess in some weird way, it, from their kind of, you know, uh, twisted sort of uh, perspective, they might see it legitimately as, oh, you're just living in sin because you're, you don't, you don't call sin what I call sin, you know, yeah. maybe. No, I think that's a good point. It's definitely fair. And I think that's given, in, I think that's probably, you know, most people do things for just reasons. Sure. Um, you know, they justify it. We we all do that. We've done stupid shit and justified it in some way. Yeah. But I think that's, that's a part of the issue about uh, with Christianity and evangelicalism in particular is that beliefs come before people. So it's mm-hmm. their apologetic now that becomes primary and the, they're not listening to the person they're putting their apologetic first the definition of sin the theory yeah. of inspiration of scripture because that's how they would define sin um so it's not just scripture it's like their interpretation of scripture they wouldn't even realize that but so it's all this apologetics before the actual person who's saying listen i'm tired of being demonized and oppressed for being gay or being trans or for being 
whatever you are, whatever you are that's wrong in their eyes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. And the, the, the frustrating thing to me, and you and I have talked about this a whole lot, the, the thing that's frustrating to me is that, you know, you can tell that they don't understand why people are deconstructing. They don't understand the main issues that people are having with, you know, evangelical Christianity that they're beginning to doubt or question things like inspiration of scripture or infallibility or penal substitution or eternal torment or whatever these, you know, sort of what I call these sort of pillars of deconstruction. And not only do they not really understand the core issues and questions people are having about those, you know, beliefs, they're not interested in actually listening and understanding. Like, I think you wrote a blog post about this as well. And I, you and I've talked about it before too. Like, um, I mean, dude, we're right here. I, I've invited Alyssa Childers. I've invited Sean McDowell. Uh, I've, I've invited these guys like, hey, either either have me on your show or or talk to me. I, I've even asked Sean McDowell, like, dude, we don't even have to record the conversation. I'm not even asking, let's do this for for hits or clicks or, or you know, likes. I'm just saying privately, could you and I just have a call so I can talk to you? I, because I feel like if you're acting like you want to help people, you're acting like you want to educate your audience uh, on these issues. Would you really like to know? Do you really want to know? Because I can, I'd love to talk to you about that. And there is no interest whatsoever. They either just ignore you completely um, or I just, you know, there's just no interest. They, they will not talk to us. Um, and again, like I'm, I'm, I've talked to people I disagree with many times. Um, I'm gracious. I'm kind. I don't attack them. I don't, you know, belittle them. I don't do gotcha questions or anything like that. Um, we can have a conversation. So uh, I, I'm still waiting for that. Still hoping that's going to happen. Yeah. And I, I would say, don't take this the wrong way, but to a fault, you're very kind when you have debates and things like that. You're uh-huh. not cutthroat at all. So it's not, yeah, they're not, they're not up against, and I'm not going to say David Bentley Hart wouldn't be right, kind, right. but he, but someone like that would be <laughs> much more cutthroat. I mean, oh, yes. so yeah, yes, I, I've watched your debate and it's like, oh, Keith is so like tame and, and not in a bad way, but that, those are the types of people like, yeah, truly, if you were truly interested you yeah. would talk to someone like you, even, I mean, even, even if, I mean, if it was recorded, the hits would be fantastic because sure. people on both sides, and I, we're not, the, the, the person who's deconstructing is not going back to watch Elisa and Sean and no. things like that. Like you and I are because we're creators and we're content creators and we're trying to have like a, a, a we're trying to finger the pulse to, to use yeah. Jordan Pepper's <laughs> thing. You know, we're trying to have a, you know, a, a finger on the, on the thing, like what's going on within Christianity sure. and how are people responding? And so they would, they would have, I think a lot of people on both sides, if, if people always claim, oh, Sean, that was really level, that was really unbiased. That, and it's like, okay, well then have that unbiased conversation with someone you really disagree with. Yeah. And that's, that's when like the rubber meets the road on, can you be, can you be unbiased as much as possible when, of course you can, when you agree with someone mm-hmm. and two people are talking about like when he, when he has on, um, uh, you know, the, the author of that book about is Christianity, is progressive and conservative Christianity a different religion? Right. And the authors and the co-authors of that book, of course, it's going to be easy to like be really respectful to someone you totally agree with. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So let's challenge ourselves here and talk to people who we don't agree with to an extent. I There's some people I don't talk to, but yeah. those are called ba- those are called boundaries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I understand. Um, yeah. But you know what? Like, for example, like my, my, my posture has always been like, so for example, like I debated, you know, Ricky Gantz, our favorite, you know, wow, uh, Ricky. Very Tricky favorite Ricky. guy. And um, number one is even though that guy's kind of a dick, I love him. I really do. I think he's a great, I mean, I, I feel like the, beneath all that, you know, uh, programming, he's actually a nice guy. And um, so like when I debated him on the gospel, um, the re- one of the reasons why I didn't go after him or I don't, anyone I debate is because I genuinely feel, I, I feel really confident that if I can just explain what I believe and why, and then I just let the other person talk, the, the listener is going to, you know, see the sort of, you know, pros and cons left and right. And, and I really think the average person is going to listen to what I'm saying and go either what Keith is saying makes more sense or, oh, I never heard that before. Like, and that's what I'm ex- interested in. So I'm, I'm fine to let the other person say whatever they want. Right. And that's, I would be the same way with Sean or Alyssa and be like, Hey, come on and say whatever you want. And I'm going to say what I want to say. And I just want listeners to make up their own minds. Cause I really feel like if you put these two ideas side by side, 
and the two sets of information side by side, a thinking person would be able to say, huh, okay, I never knew that. All right, let me think about that some more. And see, I think, but I think that's the reason why, I'm just guessing, but I'm, I'm thinking that's the reason why someone like Alyssa Childers doesn't want to have someone like you or I or any other sort of progressive Christian who really can, with a clear head, uh, you know, answer questions and say, well, actually, we see it this way and here's why we see it that way. Because I think they would be afraid that their listeners would hear what we're saying and go, oh, that does make sense. See, whereas I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid that someone's going to hear the other side of the stuff I, I deconstructed from. I'm not afraid they're going to hear that and go, oh, that makes sense. I like I like a God who would burn people in hell forever and who's petty and jealous and capricious. And that sounds really good. I think I'm going to follow that. No, I, you know what I mean? Like, go for it. Lay out, lay out your side and I'm going to lay out my side. And I really, I'm not afraid anybody is going to deconvert from, from progressive Christianity over back over to the evangelical stuff. I'm like, yeah, bring it on. I think what happens, and maybe it's too reductive to say this, but I think they are kind of, you know, I, I heard, I heard Christians say, oh, I do want my kids or whatever to come up with their own conclusions. <laughs> yeah. And then I think about it and I'm like, well, what if their conclusions are not Christianity and then they're at risk of burning in hell for all eternity? So there there could be some of that. Like if you deconstruct, you're going to burn forever in all eternity. Mm-hmm. And there is great risk at that. So don't I mean, we've got to warn people about this. So we've we've got to do the, the Lord's work and teach about, you know, what happens if you deconstruct. You're going to you're going to you know, you're going to either figuratively or literally fry for all eternity. Yeah. And I always ask, like, (laughs) even my brother has said this, you know, I want my kids to, you know, conclude their own conclusions without me telling them what to believe. And I'm like, do you though? Right. Because there there seems like, there seems to be the kind of, uh, I guess, moral case that you wouldn't want that because they're at great risk of an eternity of hell. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, if you are an evangelical Christian and you're you you are trying to ha- take that posture of like I don't really care what my kids believe, I want them to think for themselves. You're you're just assuming that they're going, you know, well, they're going to they're going to think for themselves and then they're going to read the evidence that demands a verdict book that I'm going to give them for Christmas and then yeah. they're going to decide on their own to be a Christian. Like you're you're banking that that only thing they could do, they're going to uh, come back around, right? They're going to come back. But yeah, the, once if you do that, they could come back and say, hey, mom and dad, um, I'm a Hindu, or I'm, I'm going to follow Baha'i, or I'm going to be a Muslim, and like, or nothing, I'm going to be an atheist, right? Yeah. And so you you have to understand those are the those are the possibilities. And then you have to say, I'm really okay with that. And And when you say you're really okay with that, then I question your actual belief in hell. Right. Because no, no parent would be okay with that. That would fucking, I mean, torment no, me. No, even really yeah. No, no, exactly. I would, if, if I knew, you know, uh, my, my daughter was at risk of going to hell forever if she didn't choose Jesus, I don't know how I could live without a lot of medications. Right. Oh, you'd be, you would really be, um, very, but this is why most most evangelical Christians are not open minded like that. Not even pretend open minded that way, right? They they're very protective of their kids. In fact, I mean, when I watch, uh, when I try not to, but when I have watched, uh, you know, some of those other YouTubers, you know, Mike Winger and Alyssa Childers, and those guys, like the it seems that the, that's their whole sort of uh, posture, and that's that's their whole programming, right? Is like watch this or show this to your kids or how do I talk to my kids if they're deconstructing or like, it's all about this preventative protective measures because I mean, I think most evangelical Christians are terrified of I'm going to send my kid to college and they're going to deconstruct their faith and, or, or, or they're just in general going to be on social media and talking to their friends and they're going to come home or, or and say to me, you know, and now I don't believe in the Bible being inerrant anymore. Or now I don't believe, um, whatever, you know? And and so, yeah, it seems like they're creating a lot of content for parents like this because parents are either already going through it or they're terrified of what am I going to do when Johnny or or Sally comes and says, mom, I don't believe the Bible is inerrant and infallible. I don't believe in eternal torment. I will say that they are correct about one thing. The initial questions are a slippery slope. Yes. That's the thing about deconstruction. And It's what's, it's what's scary. Like you, you start to, you know, 
well, maybe the Bible isn't 100% accurate. And then, right. well, maybe hell's not real. And then maybe it's not a sin to be gay. Yeah. And it goes all the way down to like, who the fuck am I? <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, exactly. I mean, this is the thing when I talk to people that are that have just started their deconstruction process. And a lot of times, because you do, it just sort of like you said, we've said, you, you start pulling on one simple thread and next thing you know, you oh crap, I'm deconstructing. And then like, and then because you pulled on the first thread, now then that makes you question the next thing. And then you're looking into that and then now you're questioning the next thing. And before you know it, like the whole Jenga tower is coming down. And people do feel out of control. You know, they're like, I've had people just flat out tell me, when does this end? Because because number one, it Never. creates yeah. Well, that's that that's the that's the bad news. I'm so sorry. But um but I'll Newsflash. say to them. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, I will say to them, you know, good news and bad news. I mean, it, never, but it, but in a way, that's a good thing, right? Yeah. But I was going to say, like, the, the reason why they ask, when does it end, is because, number one, they don't feel that they're in control of it, right? It's yeah. something that's happening to me. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, again, this is why it's ridiculous for people to say, before you deconstruct, like, hey, you're probably already two two miles deep in this thing before you even look around and realize, oh, crap, I'm deconstructing. Yeah. So, um, number one, so they feel out of control in, in their deconstruction process. They do wonder when it's going to stop. But see, then they, you know, sometimes people do. I've actually met people who have deconstructed maybe one or two things. And then they will like put on the brakes really hard and just uh -huh. shut down because they're so terrified of like, I can't go any farther than this. I yeah. cannot, you know, I, I, this is it. I'm going to stay right here. Yeah. And uh, I think that's unnatural. That's not healthy. You like, uh, but I understand it because you're afraid. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I hate to do a shameless plug here. And pat myself on the back. But so the book that Michelle and I have coming out called Learning to Float, I think is the best title I've come up with that describes like the book itself. Mm -hmm. Because when you deconstruct, you don't necessarily go anywhere. And right. that's the scary, that's the scary part. You simply learn to not like flail about in the ocean. And that's yeah. when you float. Yeah. And you learn to float in your doubts and you use like the of holding, you know, holding things loosely, all those yeah. kind of things. And I think that best describes deconstruction is that yeah. I'm pretty convinced about some things, but I'm pretty agnostic about some things and I'm okay with both postures. Sure. You know, I, I, I don't, I wouldn't be okay if I'm truly incorrect and God is really a Calvinist, <laughs> but I find it so preposterous that it's, it's, I'm not worried about it. I have no anxiety right. about it. There's no, there's no cortisol flowing through. No. I'm good. Yeah. Um, but as far as like how things actually work out metaphysically, what is it, do I have my Christology 100% right? No, and I don't need to, and I don't think Jesus needs me to. And, and I think when I read books on Buddhism, Jesus is not like tisk tisk. We're going to have to have a talk about that. Right. No, that's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly right. And I, and I love that metaphor of learning to float. I, um, that's, that's a really good metaphor, and that's very true. Um, like what I've told people, like when I do my square one courses, shameless plugs. So when I do these hey. square one courses that I created, um, where we walk people, I'm walking people through like for 12 weeks, um, you know, in the different phases of deconstruction and then trying to help them move into reconstruction of their faith. And by like in week two or three, so really early in the process, I always, um, encourage people that in you're going through your deconstruction process, no matter where you're at in the process, I would just say, in all your deconstructing of your the theological ideas, I strongly encourage you to deconstruct your need to be right. Mm. And, and, and and usually that makes people stop and go, what? Oh, wait a minute. What? Because um, if you can learn to do that, and maybe another metaphor for that is learning to float, right? Um, if you can learn to deconstruct your need to be right, you're going to save yourself so much pain in the future. Because what, what will happen, here's the thing, I've done this, right? So, you know... Um, it's that old quote, Joshua Lawson's quote, you know, the funny thing about my worldview is no matter how many times it changes, I'm always right. Um, and it's the truth, right? So like I used to believe, let's say I'll, I'll pick, um, I used to believe in eternal torment. And then I deconstructed that. And then I, then I believed in an annihilation. And then I, be, then I became convinced that annihilation was the right view. And then I'm defending that view and arguing that view. And anyone that doesn't believe this is stupid. And here's the reasons why it's all true. And then guess what? A few years later, I deconstructed that view and changed it again to universal reconciliation. And, and so because I've gone through that, like you believe something, you change your mind, you defend that. Then you change your mind again, and I have to defend that. But like, you look stupid because you all, 
twice now you've changed your mind and you've been right. You've been telling everyone you're right and how stupid they were and they were wrong, but then you were wrong. And so the thing about this whole, you know, the, the whole flip side of that, no matter how many times my worldview changes, I'm always right, is to take the other view, which is that I've been wrong before. Yeah. And I'm probably wrong right now about some things that I haven't figured it out yet. But one day I'm sure. going to figure out I'm wrong about this or that. And sure. guess what? I'll be wrong again in the future. And now if I if I will just accept that, you know, Richard Rohr has another quote I love where he says, you know, God has never fit inside of our boxes. So we shouldn't spend too much time defending our boxes. And so that's what I mean. Like deconstruct your need to be right. So it's okay if you change your mind about something. I think that's great. We should be open to changing our mind about something. But when you change your mind about it, don't become, now don't become dogmatic or fundamentalist about that new thing. Mm -hmm. Because then you're just another, you're still a fundamentalist. You're still someone who's right and everyone else is wrong and you're, you're having apologetic, you know, to prove it. And that's just not good for you or healthy for you. And you're just going to end up having to deconstruct it again. So um, learning to, like you said, hold loosely to the things you believe, um, deconstruct your need to be right. See, once you've deconstructed your need to be right, well, what I've noticed is like I'm now able to hear other people share other views, right? Like the other, other day we interviewed Rain Wilson. He talked about Baha'i, and I don't believe Baha'i, but I'm not as scared or offended to hear him talk about it. In fact, and as he's talking, I'm, I'm noticing all these beautiful things about it, right? Like, oh, this is great. Yeah. I like that. I like this. Well, this is good. And so... I don't need to be right. He doesn't need to be wrong. And who cares? That's not what it's about. And I totally agree with you. Um, once you break away from this sort of uh, this need to be right and this fundamentalist kind of the- theological postures, um, yeah, you kind of relax a little bit. You are a lot less you know, anxiety and anger and frustration about, you know, trying to save everybody or getting everyone to agree with you. Um and, and you just like, you just can relate to people as other people, right? What are yeah. your views and your ideas? And I don't have to agree with you, but I might learn something. And, yeah. you know, that's yeah. cool. That's, that's why I, I loved, I loved Rain's conversation. I loved how we ended it too. Because after all the discussion about Baha'i, it was like, at the end of the day, treat people kindly, yep. love your neighbor, reject your nationalism, your xenophobia, your racism. Yep. And, and just try to be the best version of a human being that you can be. Yeah. And that's that's the, I think that's like the nugget of truth in all the great faith traditions approached mystically or approached in a certain way, non-dogmatically, non-dually. Yeah. So if you, if you listen to Jesus or the Buddha, Muhammad, Rumi, yep. if you approach any of them dogmatically, I think you've missed the point of them. So... Uh, that's yeah. I I loved that conversation with Rain. Not just because you know I'm an Office fanboy. But uh, you are. I I am that, of course. <laughs> but I I became. I mean, of course, I I've listened to Rain before on on podcasts and interviews and things like that. And I was a fan of him as a person. Yes. But he, even more so now, and not just because he listened to the Heretic Happier and liked it. That was funny, man. That was a crazy yeah. thing, actually. When he was when he was saying, "Oh yeah, I listened to a couple episodes and love what you guys are doing," I was yeah. like, "Wow!" That I wanted is- to be like, "Stop, stop! Is the universe <laughs> playing a trick on me right now? Is this real? Is this real?" <laughs> so wait a second. The guy Dwight Schrute listened Dwight Schrute. to my podcast, and now he, I'm talking to him. Yeah. He actually was on our podcast. That was so great. Yeah, yeah. and it, yeah, it's 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 crazy how those things. That's what I love so much about her to cap era. Like it has become, like. It started in the most grassroots way possible. Yeah. And from nothing, from like three of us who we had one conversation all together before. Yeah. It was a great conversation. And we barely knew each other. Actually. Barely knew each other. And then four years later, a little more than four years later, we're talking to the guy who played Dwight Schrute. Like <laughs> yeah. when my wife was pregnant, this was like over 11 years ago, almost 12 years ago. She became preeclamptic, right? Mm-hmm. So she was on bed rest for her, her her last trimester. So all we did every night was basically watch The Office. That's so great. And that's when we started becoming huge fans and like binge watching it. Before, uh, I mean, while it's on DVD, not this is not this is not Netflix streaming or anything like that. And so it's like, man, twelve to think twelve years later, ah, hey, you're gonna talk to that guy on your that, podcast. That's yeah. crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, I tell you what, yeah, this, that is the thing too. Like, and sometimes I, I don't stop and think about it. Like, or when I do stop and think about it, I am kind of amazed. Like, 
Uh, it usually will happen when I'm talking to other, like someone brand new and I'm trying to explain that I have this podcast and they're like, well, what do you guys do? And, and I'm like, well, I'm trying to, I'm always like grasping for people we've interviewed that they would have known, like who, who yeah. these people are like, but like, and I realized like, crap, we talked to like Carlton Pearson, um, the black Klansman, um, just, uh, you know, your, your boy, your boy, John Fugelsang, John Fugelsang. Yes. David Billy Hart. I mean, damn. I mean, yeah. and now Rain Wilson, I mean, now Rain Wilson. Rob yeah. Bell. I mean, we've we've had some pretty amazing guests on the show. Uh, Michael Petroni, the guy that, that uh, was you know, the showrunner for uh, yeah. the Messiah show on Netflix. Like Rachel before she passed away. Nadia. You know, yeah, yeah. Rachel Held Evans. That was and it was you know I, we we never really talked too much about the Rachel thing. And I just what broke my heart about Rachel Held Evans was we had talked to her for that first time, and that was such a beautiful conversation. She was amazing. She was just wonderful. She was even she had even said. Um, during that interview, like, oh yeah, send me your book and um, I'll read it and write a, an endorsement quote for it. And I was like, wow, that's so great. And I sent her the book. And I think maybe a month or so later, it was pretty quick after we'd interviewed her. It was her. pretty she, quick. She yeah. died. And I was just, and she had just had a baby. She was talking even in that interview about this little baby she had had. Yeah, her kids are young. And that just broke my heart, man. Like, oh my gosh, these little kids now that their mom is gone. And it was just like so sudden and unbelievable just so heartbreaking and um and the impact she's still having an impact today i mean i still see people sharing i don't know memes or quotes or interviews or you know things with her book and uh yeah. very short amount of time she had a phenomenal impact so that was great i don't think that. you i don't think you realize like how much of an impact you're going to have on the world and generally those who have the biggest impact i mean it's after they pass yeah. i mean if you looked at her her books went to number one yep not not just in the categories like we fuck around with, yeah. but like number one on Amazon, <laughs> like 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 in the big leagues. Like I mean, and she was already you know super popular before, but right. It's I hate I cringe that I'm even gonna. I mean, it's like it's like that passage that all things work towards the good. I'm not suggesting that right. in an evangelical way, at any sort of way, but it just seems like the the people with the most prophetic voices, yeah. It's after their passing that, you know, it's like it, you're you built your legacy. Yes. And of course, she passed on way too young. Yeah. Um, but she built that legacy in the short time she was here, and it's transcended her own life, and it is going to impact more people down the road. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's just um kind of a sobering reminder that uh, while our lives are totally finite in this world. Um, you never know what kind of impact you're going to have even after you're gone. Right. And I think that's very, very true. I mean, I don't even think we, we definitely don't know the impact we're even having now that we're alive. Right. No, I mean, I'm no sure idea. you get, you get messages. I get emails from people. Um, they're not right? all just hate mail. No, exactly. I mean, we do, we definitely <laughs> do get those, but I really, I really, you know, I treasure, I get these total like messages from, I mean, I do not know these people. Right. And, yeah. You know, well, that your book really helped me with, you know, understanding this or that, or, you know, you say you were saying, putting into words something in your blog post that I have always thought, but, you know, didn't have the words for it or whatever. And like any, any, any time you get those kinds of messages, um, it means so much. And I always keep in mind, like there's a marketing thing, by the way, because my, my experience of marketing is that, um, like we tell people in, in businesses, like if you get a, if you get a complaint from one customer, that one customer probably represents another, like, you know, 50 people who didn't send you an email to complain. Right. Yeah. And, um, and it's true on the opposite side too. If one person writes you a letter and says, Hey, I just wanted to stop and let you know how much I like, I enjoyed your product or how much this meant to me. Again, that one person probably is representing, you know, their voice counts for like another 20, 30, 40 people. And so it's the same, it's the same case for like you and I, when we get these positive messages from random strangers who are like, Hey, I just wanted to take a second, and let you know how much this meant to me. Um, like, wow, I mean, there's so many other people who didn't stop and do that, but you know, you're having an impact and that's great. I mean, that's, that's the reason why as a, as a writer and a blogger and a podcaster and all those things, um, we keep doing it, right? Because yeah. we're not rolling the cash over here. It's like you Don't do speak it for because... yourself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're new to the show, so you're going to see all the money oh, rolling in yeah, soon. Okay. Just you wait. <laughs> Just you wait. Oh, boy. I can't wait for that. <laughs> uh, results not guaranteed. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No, that's it. That's it. And you're, it, I don't know if this is true in marketing, but I would tend to guess most people, more people are apt to complain than give praise. 
Yes. So, so yeah. If you, yeah. If you get neg- if you get something negative, maybe ten people agree with you. If you get something positive, probably a hundred yeah, agree with them. That's right. No, you're right. See, that's you're exactly right. See, yeah. The uh, the negative. Um, most people, if they have a negative experience, they're going to write to you and complain to yeah. you, right? Like for example, I just flew American Airlines uh, coming back from Tulsa and had the worst, one of the worst experiences of my life um, through American Airlines. And guess what? Came home and then right away went to the website complained and I got a $150 voucher. So, Hey, it worked. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know, how many times have you had a great experience at a restaurant or even on a flight? Like, Hey, the, the stewardess was awesome. And the, the yeah. flight, the flight crew was so cool. They gave me extra snacks or whatever and blah, blah, blah. Yep. Yeah. You don't, you don't go home right away, write an email no. about that. Yeah. No. Well, let me just, let me just put things in perspective for you, Keith. Have you ever flown boutique air? <laughs> I have, um, I have flown. Um, oh, what was the? I already blocked Spirit. Them. No, not Spirit. Uh, Frontier. I'll tell you a Frontier, Frontier Airlines story. That was the worst story of my freaking life. Was Frontier wow. Airlines? But tell your boutique airline story. Well, I'll just say this. I, I've told it before. <laughs> I don't remember where. But if you ever want humble pie, have Rafael Palendo book a flight for you to L.A. for a live show. The Heritage Capiar. You'll and and have it be on a place that advertises themselves as uh, flying private for the price of commercial. Okay. And the brochures are phenomenal. I'm like, dude, I'm flying a private jet to L.A. for Ooh, a show, baby. I I have fucking made it. <laughs> You've arrived. I have arrived. And then you show up to what this airplane is, dude. Did you have to duck- cast it up yourself? <laughs> dude, no. The, the I mean, the pilot checks you in. When when I flew back from LA, <laughs> when I flew back from LA, it was in the corner of LAX, no lights, just the dome light on the plane, one prop on the front. Things were duct taped. I sat backwards with a harness on. This motherfucker, he 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 said, "See, what did he say? If if there's a loss of pressure, that you know, the things will come down, but don't worry, we won't be flying that high." Oh shit. <laughs> Wait a minute! You're not flying that high. I get, dude. It, dude, I could. When we took off, I was sitting backwards, so I could see, still see LAX. I could still see LA like a half an hour into the flight. Right. It took it took us two hours to fly from from LA to Merced, and then another hour to fly from Merced to Sac. Merced's a 45 minute drive. It took us an hour. <laughs> I could have rented a fucking car and drove to Sac, dropped off the car, and got my car and drove home. So your airspeed was like 70 miles an hour. Dude, like you're I, barely. <laughs> before like takeoff and sitting on the tar, all that shit. Yeah. So was that a it, prop plane? That was a prop. It was a one, one prop on the front. One the, prop? One prop on the front. The guy was like, wait, I'm not fat shaming, but wait. Like I worried he was going to have a stroke or a heart yeah. attack. And I was like, watch, I was watching him, I turned around with my neck, neck cranked. Watching him like, okay, so if this motherfucker slumps over on his chair, <laughs> I got to figure out at least how to how to guide this thing in. There was no co-pilot? No co-pilot. I was, was scared. Sh- there was only six of us or eight of us on the plane. Oh my gosh, dude. It was so scary. And he when he gave his little spiel, he was like, you know, uh, we got exits here, here, and here. Don't use that one, which is the one next to me, because it doesn't work. Oh, good. I was like, dude, are these not? Yeah, is this is this not inspected? Is this on the like on the slide that I'm getting on this plane here? Oh right. my god, boutique air. Um, I didn't write him a review because there were like thousands of them. Don't ever fly this airline. I'll never right. do it again. You, you don't have to. You don't have to. Say I don't it. have to. But no. you're putting it on this podcast right now, so it's going out to the. To it's the whole going world. out to all twelve listeners, and yeah. I will. I will say that if Ralph ever offers to get you a ticket to somewhere kindly kindly reject it and say you spend the money <laughs> spend the money on yourself oh yes oh uh, man that's that's a crazy story yeah my it's frontier scary. airline story i won't i won't go into the whole thing my kids my my both my boys will tell this story probably for the rest of their life uh because they were young when this happened and it definitely made a scar uh, on their psyche but uh, yeah, we spent the night in Denver airport trying to fly home. Uh, well, due to my parents, to, sorry, to Wendy's parents' house uh, in Tennessee for Christmas. And it, we didn't just have bad customer service from Frontier Airlines in Orange County airport, but we did. And then in Denver, but, but we did. And also from Frontier Airlines employees in Nashville, because we did. And then flying back, and I think there was a connection to Phoenix, and then they were they were also assholes in Phoenix. Like it's like 
the whole company policy, every person we interacted with from Frontier was a jerk. And they they had like the opposite of customer service, right? Like I used to teach customer service training uh, years ago when I was in sales. And, um, and my whole thing was like, you know, customer service is this, it's so important. And all those things I was telling you, like, you know, the complaints that you get, like, yeah. And all that. So you want to make sure that if you make the, you need to make the customer happy, whatever it takes, and, and they're not happy. It's not resolved until the customer tells you that they're that they're okay, that it's resolved. And you know, and and um, it's one of these things about the. Um, there's one of these things about the lifetime value of a customer that um, that if 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 let's say you know the customer spends a hundred dollars on something and then they wants to return it and they don't have a receipt, and but they're upset or whatever about they don't like the product. It's better for you to give them the hundred dollars back, and um, and keep them as a customer, because then they will in their lifetime they will do probably tens of thousands of dollars of business with you, right? If you yeah. make them happy that one time, yeah. but but if you um, if you don't resolve their issue, you could think ah this was only like a twenty dollar purchase or a fifty dollar purchase. So, you know what? Screw that guy. Forget him. You know, get out of here. We don't need you. The thing is that that person, that one person, um, for the rest of their life, will tell that story at parties, at mm-hmm. you know, uh, at family gatherings, to total strangers in the doctor's office. They'll say, you know, what? let me yeah. tell you about the time I flew Frontier Airlines, and they'll tell yeah. you the story. And so, the you, it's impossible for your company to spend enough money to over over you know to to. Um, to uh, to cancel out the negative word of mouth advertising that you will get from that one customer that you yep. screwed that one time for twenty dollars, and because they're going to tell that story the rest of their life, like literally, your company could, you know, spend millions of dollars and buy a freaking Super Bowl ad that is and you know directed by Steven Spielberg, starring Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, and that commercial on the Super Bowl could just be like the best commercial anybody has ever seen. But that one person that you screwed that one time will watch it and go, great commercial, but they still suck. And let me tell you a story. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. You can't overwhelm. You can't overcome it. So I, I, all this stuff's in my head. And I'm like, and I'm, and I'm just noticing how Frontier Airlines, like every single person there is a dick. Like they just don't care how they treated us. It was horrible. So yeah, I, I even wrote a blog. I was so pissed off. Um, well, first I, first I wrote a blog post about it, told the whole story. Then I shared a link to the blog and on Twitter, I, I hashtagged Frontier Airlines and I added Frontier Airlines Twitter account. And I uh-huh. did that relentlessly for like, <laughs> like Jesus. 48 hours until the president of Frontier Airlines contacted me and asked me to stop doing that <laughs> and then said, let's talk privately. I'd like to resolve your issue. And so I thought, oh, good, finally, I'm going to get some traction, right? And so I stopped doing it, and I, I, I messaged him like a couple of times privately, and guess what? He ghosted me and never saw the problem. So see, it goes all the way to the top. And now everyone, listen, I, there's no way I'm flying Frontier Do Airlines not. ever. Even if, I mean, if they're still in, in existence, I well, don't know. Well, let me tell you, just real simply, um, part of the reason why Frontier Airlines uh just you shouldn't fly them, is that um, their hub, their base of operations is in Denver. Like, for for example, Southwest Airlines, their hub is in uh, Love Field in Dallas, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where all their main, their planes, you know, will come in and out of uh, Love Field in Dallas and all that stuff. So, but Frontiers is Denver. So let's just think about this. Um, How often during winter months do you think Denver gets snowed in? Probably most of the time. Yeah, less with climate change, but still, yes, yeah. It's freaking Denver, okay? They're a mile in the sky, yeah. and in the winter, yeah. they get snowed in probably half the time at least. So because of that, like if you're trying to fly home for Christmas or Thanksgiving, don't fly Frontier because they yeah. you're guaranteed you're going to spend the night in the Denver airport like we did. Yeah, yeah, good call. Well, Keith, this has been fun, man. This is uh, are we are we what did we decide? Are we going to do we're going to do every other week, and we're going to have episodes come out. On the opposite weeks of Heretic Happy Hour, correct? That's right. So you can get your uh, get your fix. You can have a, your- a, an un- unbroken stream of of, of uh, Keith and Matt uh, between Heretic Happy Hour and uh, Apostates yeah. Anonymous. 
And who cares about Katie and Derek? They, if, if they, I mean, if, if they had, I would promote their VD show, the Valentine's yes. Day show. I hate the acronym, but, you know. I think it's hilarious. I think it's great. The VD, um, yeah, the Valentine's Day podcast. If they would do it, uh, yeah, I would, I would promote it. I, think I, I would promote it, but uh, all they do is talk shit. They don't ever come through. I mean, we gave them two whole episodes on Heritage That's Happy right. to, their, to themselves and whatever. Well, I guess well, that's know. enough for them. We'll yeah. see what happens. Um, we'll see what happens. And then, yeah, we talked about possibly, you know, um, I think, yeah, we'll come up with some bits as, as things. Maybe it'll develop organically. But, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll definitely do some reactions uh, to whatever, uh, you know, some of these guys throw out there on deconstructing. We talked about doing things like, you know, um, something like adventures and misunderstanding deconstruction or, or things like that. When people make comments like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure we'll come up with stuff. And by the way, if you're listeners, if you think of things that you'd like us to talk about or things that would be fun, um, here's what you could do. Call the Heretic Happy Hour hotline and just let them know, <laughs> hey, this is for the Apostates Anonymous, and then leave a message and we'll get it. Don't do worry. it. Do it. 240-343-7379. That's, again, 240-343-7379. What's hilarious is that's the first time I think you've remembered it. <laughs> We're not doing it. I always remember it. I just try not to step on Derek's toes because it's like, I ain't trying to get in front. I did it one time, step in front of a black man and try to take his, his, he's never going to let it down. That's right. You know, it's just another, another part of white supremacy. That's and, right. White privilege. That's right. Love, uh, love, you, love you, Derek and Katie. I know you're you listening. Guys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, see you next time. Listeners, see you next week. Any, any, any last things? Do you have anything to promote, Keith? Oh, Books. there's always always something. Um, what am I doing? Mm. What are you going to do after Jesus Un? Have you announced that yet? I don't know if I have announced it, but I will. I'll go in and say it here. Yeah, I'm actually writing it at the moment. Um, it's nice. a little bit about what we talked about, uh, kind of. So I'm writing a book about embracing mystery and nice. um, the need to not be right, and um, you know what. But I'm. I want it to be more than that. Like I actually started writing. I've written the introduction and the first and the second chapters, and. Um, and you know what? I just wasn't feeling it. I was like, this just feels like all the other books I've written. Like, I don't want it. I don't want this yeah. book post Jesus on to be just like another book. So I scrapped it and I started from scratch. And I now I feel like I totally got the vibe. I want this thing to be really, really, really heavy on the mystery side, uh, embracing the mystery and um, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I got now I've got the first chapter and I'm really happy. So I'm moving forward with that. And hopefully it'll be out early sometime next year. Nice. Is it is it nice to step outside of something you've been doing for so long? Oh my gosh, it really is. Um, I mean, I loved writing that series. I, I'm, I'm so proud of it. I mean, look, I still look at those seven books. I'm like, damn, did I really do that? Well, okay, wow, I'm really proud of that. But at the same time, I'm happy that I get to write something like totally brand new, completely different. Um, and I, I don't feel like in any way I'm confined by whatever. It has to be yeah. Jesus on something, right? It's yeah. just like, I can just write about whatever I want. And I'm really yeah. excited about this topic. Well, good. Yeah, man. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. We'll see you next time. All right. Take care. Bye.